Good morning, everyone. Welcome to New Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're glad to have you with us today. If you could all please stand and as we uh, start to sing and uh, lift praise to our God. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I'd hear you call. But Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you loved me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation You predestined to adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station And I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost you knew the great and terrible cost, but Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone, but nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you paid my debt. And by your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. And I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The Spirit me see. I swore I knew the way on my own, head full of rocks and heart made of stone. The spirit you moved in me. And at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart the light of Christ is shown. Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven said to sin by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone. And I will run the race by grace and grace alone. And I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Good morning. Glad to gather together to worship our God for all that he's done for us and all that he keeps doing in us and for us. Hear the Lord, he's going to call us to give him worship, and then we're going to spend uh, the next season of time giving him back to what he's, what he's asked, called us to do. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, and he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He cast the wicked to the ground. So sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to, to our God on the lyre. Let's pray. Let's ask God to help us do what he's just called us to do. Our Heavenly Father, we come and we want to sing and pray praises to you. For you have been faithful. You are great. You are abundant in power. You heal the brokenhearted. That's been us. That's some of us today as we're here. You gather us together. You bind up our wounds. You who are the creator 
have even more so been the new creator, the recreator. And we thank you that you sent your son, our Lord Jesus, who came and lived in our place and died in our place. And as you've raised him up with you, you've now poured out your spirit to open our ears, open our eyes, to fill us with love and joy and peace. And we pray that as we worship you today, that your spirit would cause us to see you and to hear you and give us responsive hearts. We pray there'd be harmony between our hearts and our lips and that you would make us whole today. We come to you with many needs. We ask for you to meet with us. We pray that we would leave here different than when we came because we have met with you the living and the true God, through your Son, our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. The night is dark. 
Can have a seat, if you will. We are going to pray to our God now, and uh, but as we do, we're going to pray together at the beginning, and we're going to uh, confess our sins. Uh, we go to Him because of His mercy, and we acknowledge uh, that He's God and, and that we're not, and uh, and then we revel in the fact that uh, because we confess. Uh, he will forgive those who confess their sins. So join me. It should be up on the, on the wall uh, and in your uh, bulletin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are new creations, but we are still great sinners, and this confuses and discourages us. Instead of marveling at your love for weak and sinful creatures, we try to hide our sins and reform ourselves, rather than see each other as gloriously redeemed people. We focus on the weaknesses of others and magnify our own strengths. Father, forgive us. Jesus, thank you for living the life of grace and mercy that we should live, reconciling your people to God and to one another. Holy Spirit, reconcile us to our own weakness 
so that we will look away from ourselves to Christ often. Teach us to rest in Christ, to make us people who graciously lead others to find rest and peace in him and with one another. We ask all this in the name of your son, our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's take a minute or so and uh, confess your sins personally and just privately to the Lord, and then I will continue to lead us in prayer in a moment. Our Father, having confessed our sin to you, we thank you for your promise that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Please cause us to believe your promises, to, to believe that you, you act according to your promises. That we can bank on that and help us to uh, resist and to disallow the voices in our ears that tell us that our sin is bigger than your son's death. Father, fill our imaginations with how you've poured out your love into our hearts by your spirit. And we ask by your spirit you'd help us to resist the devil, that he would flee from us. Give us awareness of the faultiness of his accusations and when he's accusing us, that we would stand in the armor of Christ. And we pray that you'd help us resist the temptations that he shoots across our bows and uh, that he... Uh, encourages our flesh in and, and the fiery darts with which he attacks us. We thank you, Father, that he who is in us is greater than he who is against us. We ask that you would work out in us the, the fruit of your spirit. You've given us of yourself, and so when we are wronged, help us to love our enemies. When we suffer, give us joy. When we can't see the way out, work peace in us. When we need to wait, help us persevere with patience. When we're annoyed with people, Lord, produce in us kindness. When our hearts start to boil over at injustice towards us, grant us gentleness. And when we're weary or we're tempted to go our own way, work out faithfulness in us. And when we're at our wit's end, give us self-control. Father, those are the fruits your spirit needs to produce in us so that we don't just respond to life out of our own flesh, our own natural ways, but your spirit, your supernatural way. So it be for your glory. God, give us hearts that just yearn to, to, to be with you and to know you, to reflect you, to honor you, uh, to, to recognize that obedience to you is where we find life. Father, our, our, our hearts are heavy at the injustice perpetrated recently by the officers in Memphis, and it, and it reminds us to ask you to be at work in our governing authorities. Cause them to do justly and to love mercy. Please work integrity into our leaders nationally and locally and across our commonwealth. Please honor integrity and stifle corruption, which is caused by self-aggrandizement, or uh, cultivate peace so that we can live before you. Lord, we ask you to build up your church as well. We ask that you bless the preaching and the hearing of your word here in the, in the churches across our city and our region and our nation, across the world, as people are worshiping you. We, we're not alone. We join with millions around the globe today giving you praise and worship. We pray that you just build up love among one another and unity and, and faithfulness and community. With our own church family, we ask that you comfort those who are grieving loss. There are those who are suffering trials with severe health challenges, some just long, ongoing. Pray that you'd give the fruit of endurance to them and, and, and faith to, to lean into you, Father. There are some people who are just in 
circumstantial dilemmas or uh, fractured relationships. Uh, comfort, comfort your people, Father. Encourage those who are weak. Heal those who, who are firm. Strengthen those who, who feel no hope. We pray that you help all of us in our belief, in our unbelief. And give us boldness. To, to lovingly tell others of, of your greatness and of your glories and of the work of your son and what you have done for us. In particular, Father, we pray for our missionary. We pray for Nate Longjohn, who's serving Virginia Beach with a fellowship of Christian athletes. And we praise you, Father, that you've raised up through him a, a group of five to ten surfers who are meeting weekly to study the Bible. We pray that you'd be establishing that group and helping them connect with uh, just the, the huge number of uh, students and, uh, who, who go down weekly down to the beach here and, uh, to, to surf. And we pray that you bless their efforts and work out all their efforts as they seek to plan a week of surf camp in July. We pray that you bless the, the growing huddles at camp Kempsville High and provide volunteers to, to launch a girls' basketball huddle and, and a character coach for the boys' baseball team. And Lord, we pray that you'd bless the launch of the, the first campus huddle at Kellum High School this month and that you'd strengthen the student leaders. And you would bless that work and reach that campus for Jesus. Lord, we, we pray for our entire rising generation to know you, to, to love Jesus, to love his word, to know his word. We pray for our own children, Lord. We thank you for the teachers and for the parents who are pouring into them. Father, and we pray that your spirit would just give a, a harvest of, of righteousness, of fruit for the word that's being planted in their hearts. We pray that you'd give hearing ears. We thank you for the, the preschool in which we have so many children from the community who, who just hear the word day by day by day. We pray, Lord, that you'd raise up a generation to love you and that would have courage for your kingdom and delight in you. We ask for all of us, Lord, that we'd be faithful to you. You'd, we'd trust in you day by day. We'd reflect your image in which you created us. We ask all this uh, through the name of your son, our Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're getting ready to uh, take up the offering. We're going to sing an, another song. Any of the children ages four years old through kindergarten can head out. I want to mention that you've probably gotten a text or a, an email or you, you'll see in the bulletin uh, that we are again doing the crates for Ukraine and you can, there's a drop down menu uh, if you want to give online towards that. We've got people, there's specific items that they're trying to gather in the crates and so we've got people who will be purchasing those so uh, you can do that by contributing cash. So thanks.
Amen. Let's stand and sing praise to that God with the doxology. Father, we acknowledge that you, your Son, Jesus, your Spirit, Father, Son, Spirit, that you are worthy of our praise. You have given us all that we have. You've given us life. You've given us new life. You've given us hope. You've given us this day. You've given us our abilities and our aptitudes and our capacities and our limitations. So all we have is, is from you, and so we acknowledge that tangibly by giving back to you with these tithes and these offerings. Uh, they are yours because we are yours, Father. So take all that we've given you and use it for your glory, but take all that we've kept and use that for your glory too, Father. We are yours 100% regardless of what we give you. And so glorify yourself in us, whatever that takes, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. You will. I want to mention that on uh, Saturday, uh, the Presbytery, which is kind of the, the regional gathering of, of churches, is meeting, and we're actually hosting uh, that group here uh, at New Covenant. We'll have a worship service from 8.30 to 9, and you're invited. It's open. We'd love to have you come join us if you're so inclined on Saturday morning. And you can even hear about some of the work that God's doing here in the area, including uh, uh, quite a bit of report talking about church planting, starting new churches here in the area. And we, it looks like we might have somebody to uh, help us start an ethnic church uh, up on the peninsula that we're excited about, as well as other efforts. So... At the very least, pray for us uh, that we'll work together and uh, also, but we'd love to have you come join us. Well, it'll just be during the morning. We should be done by, uh, by lunchtime. Um, last week, we began a three-part series on looking at the Imago Dei, which is uh, the discussion of the fact that God created mankind in his image. And last week we focused particularly on the, the application and the implications of that with regard to sanctity of life. And today we're going to pick up on that and we're going to uh, talk about how in the way that God disclosed this, revealed it in uh, the scriptures in Genesis 1, we're going to be in Genesis 1, he gave us a foundation and a framework for, regarding marriage. So uh, join me, if you will. I'm going to begin reading at the end of Genesis 1, beginning of verse 26. Hear the word. Then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. I'm going to stop there. You've, you've heard from the Lord. Let's, let's pray and ask him to help us understand this and apply it to our lives. Father, you who caused those things happen, to happen and you unfolded them through your word, by your spirit. Uh, and then you told Moses about it. So he would write it down for, for your people. to Understand how you put everything together and where they fit and where we fit. But you preserved it for these thousands of years so that we would hear it. So Father, we need your spirit who taught that to Moses. We need your spirit to impart it in our hearts, help us understand it and apply it and delight in what you have done 
and what this means in our lives. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's interesting in what I just read, you hear God very clearly say he's got a purpose. He had an intent to create mankind in his image, and then he did it. Okay, he had a purpose, and then he accomplished the purpose. He said, let's, let's make man in our image and our likeness, and then it says he, he did it. The reason why he characterized it this way and had Moses write it down and explain it this way was because in the day when this was written, the people would have understood because kings, they want their people to know who's ruling them, right? We get it nonstop. We have 24-7 news where you always see who's, who's ruling you and making clear who, who it is that's in charge. Well, it was the same way back then, except they didn't have the internet and they didn't have the airwaves. I guess they had airwaves. They didn't know how to use them. Okay. They didn't even have print. So the kings would let the people in these other towns know who was in charge by establishing images of themselves, statues, or on coins. Remember Jesus when they asked him about paying taxes? He says, who, who's, take out a coin. Who, whose image is on the coin? And they said, Caesar. He, they got, he wanted them to know who was king. He said, well, give to Caesar what Caesar's. And give to God what is God's. The image on the coin was Caesar's. The image on us is God. Give Caesar the cash and give me yourselves. And so when God was placing his image on mankind, he was establishing images of himself so it would be clear who ruled. And when he gave them the command to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, he wasn't just talking about having lots of babies and having children and having families, although that's what it would look like. But he was very specifically meaning multiply images of me to show that I rule all the earth. That was, that was God's plan and that was uh, God's intent. But the way that Moses described this, I, I believe and I want to show you, shows also God's intent in marriage because that was part of what he created right out of the box before the fall, before things were broken uh, by sin. So for example, the first thing we see is the picture of marriage in the imago dei, the image of God. If you look at verse 26, that first phrase uh, part, he says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That's kind of interesting because where does the hour come from? I mean, I think the only understandable or, or thing that may, and I've got wonderful Old Testament scholars that I love and respect who believe otherwise, but uh, there are also many who, who concur that this is talking about the Trinity. When it's, let's make man in our image. It's the Father and the Son and the Spirit in counsel together saying, let mankind reflect us. Trinity is one God, three persons. And then God said, in the second part of the verse, let them have dominion. So when he's saying let's make man in our image, he then says it's plural. Let them have dominion. So he's not just speaking of one person, although God's attributes are reflected in us individually. He's rational. We're rational. He's creative. We have measures of creativity. God redeems and renews. And, he, and we have those abilities as well. But God is saying that he, plural, is making himself in the image of man, but he says them, plural, and then in verse 27, and I want to point out, this is, this is poetry. Okay. When you think of poetry that, that we read English, in English, what, what, are the, what do we look for in poetry? Meter, rhymes. In Hebrew poetry, it was characterized by what we call parallelism. Think of the Proverbs. You know how in Proverbs you'll have two lines, and the first line will make a statement, and the second line will make the same statement, but it says it a little bit differently, or might flip it around, or it adds in a little curveball in the second line. 
Well, this is actually three lines. And the first line says, so God created man in his own image. And then it flips it. In his own image, God created him. Right? So you see that parallel. And then the third line is also parallel, but it throws in a curveball. And it says, male and female, he created them. In other words, the, the creation was not just an individual man, Adam. It's not just that God's image is in men alone. It's in male and female. And this would have been radical because probably for the first time in history, it was being revealed that women were equal with men, equally reflecting the image of God. It wasn't just individuals, it was also a plurality, okay? Now, this is not demeaning if you're uh, single. Jesus was single, the apostle Paul was single, and they were made in the image of God. And again, all of us as individuals do reflect the image of God. But I think that Moses and God through Moses was in particular pointing out about marriage because there are things about marriage in a married couple that reflect the Trinity, I mean, what are, what are the characteristics of the Trinity? Well, think about what Jesus said in John 5. Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. I mean, hear that unity? There's this unity of purpose. They're 100% on the same page, which points to their unity of being. You know, we talk about the Trinity is one in substance, and they're equal, they're equal in substance and in power and in glory. There's this absolute unity, and yet they, they have, uh, and, and, it's, and it's based in love. Jesus talks about the love the Father has for him and what he does out of love for the Father. Further, Jesus says in John 14, he said, Do you not believe that I am in the Father? And the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. So again, more of this intense unity within the Trinity, but the unity actually bears itself out in the works that demonstrate the fact that they're on the same page. And so the Trinity is composed of this unity, but, it, but there's a diversity because you have the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Now, it's not three gods. It's one God. It's not three manifestations of God. It's not God showing himself three different ways. That's a heresy. Okay, it's there are three persons and there's one God. But so, so the way this translates to marriage is that the goal of marriage is unity amidst diversity. Got the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They each have their own roles, and yet they're in absolute unity. And God imprinted this on marriage from the very beginning. The, the diversity is acknowledged. Father, Son, Spirit. We call it the economic trinity. When I was, I think I've mentioned before, I was examined for licensure way back, and somebody asked me, called out from the crowd, they're asked if there are any questions. They asked me if I knew the difference between the ontological trinity and the economic trinity. And I said, that's a good question. <laughs> I learned real fast, though, now I know. The economic trinity is what they do. Okay, you think about their work. The Father created and plans everything. The Son carries it out, and the Holy Spirit applies it to us. They have different roles. But they all are, abs There's one, you know, Jesus said, the Father's in me, and I'm in the Father. He said, I don't do anything apart from what the Father tells me. So they're utterly on the same page, but they're, they've got different roles. And so there's diversity that's acknowledged there, and we've just heard in the passage that God created man and woman. God created as man, and God created as woman. Okay, you, you don't self-define, God defines you. And you're created to be a man or a woman. It's, his, it's his, his decision, his stipulation. But as far as marriage goes, it tells us there's diversity. I mean, you can't get more diverse than a man and a woman. Amen? Right? But the goal is unity. 
we just read about how the Trinity are in union. They're, they're on one page. In the same way, Father, the Father tells us that's what's going on in marriage. In fact, if you read at the end of Genesis 2, which summarizes all that's been ta taught in chapters 1 and 2 about marriage, he says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The NIV translated as uh, he, he shall hold fast to his wife. But the word has this idea of cleave, this idea of becoming one flesh. There's a unity that comes out of the diversity. And, of course, in marriage, that, that it's pictured physically to be real obvious to us. That's the reason for the, the sanctity of, of sex, that the physical reflects an emotional and a spiritual unity that's, that's part of a covenant that their vows had been made to each other. And so that's why God is so, you know, radically against intimacy outside of marriage because he's put his picture there for a reason. And he doesn't want to, the picture to be marred or skewed. And for intimacy to exist outside of marriage in whatever form it is, skews the picture that he's established. And so, you know, the devil hates God, and the devil wants to mar the picture of God and wants to mar the glory of what can happen of this unity amidst diversity. And so, of course, he wants to taunt us and coach us and you know, tempt us, persuade us to, to, uh, to push against that. But he has given this picture of the emotional and the spiritual intimacy, but it's all part of a, of a covenant that goes on. And so, you see, God's plan is to show off the Trinity. So he creates marriage, that every marriage, whether you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian, for everybody in the world who's not Christians, nonetheless, they can't stop the fact that if they're married, there's the ability to have, intimate, to have unity amidst the diversity reflects and therefore gives the plausibility to who God is as the Trinity. That, I mean, the Trinity lives that each one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, lives totally for the glory of the other. They live to serve one another. They live to lift them up to them, for them to be exalted. They, they give and they honor one another within, within the Trinity. And if we think about implications for our marriages, you know, that, it starts right there. Not, not that you are locked in on, is my spouse giving to me and honoring to me, but I start with my own self. How am I giving? Am I honoring? Is that, is that the full corpus of what I'm trying to accomplish? Or am I trying to get giving? Or am I trying to get honor uh, that's being, being shown to me? So, and there, the other implication you think about in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, they existed from all eternity, and they were good as gold. They were happy. There was full love towards one another and joy. And they, they wanted to expand that. They wanted it to be able to be seen and experienced and reflected and glorified. And so they created creation. So the first relationship we call the, the inextra within the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And the whole creation exists to participate in who they are as the Trinity. In the same way, a couple... A married couple is there that for the love to be there, and the fruit of their love is what? Children, the people around them. But the primary relationship is the marriage. And so don't, don't, don't let your children come before your marriage. The most important thing you can do for your children is have them be the fruit of, of your love and, and the taste of that because that's what his design is because that's how the Trinity works. And the more that you work in accord with how God has designed it, the more beneficial and the more you're going to reap good things from it. If he's made us for unity, then when you have disunity come, which it does, right, because you have diversity, where do you think that's coming from? Again, the devil, Satan hates God, and if there's healthy unity amidst the diversity and that image is God, his tactic, of course, is what? Divide and conquer. 
And I'll never, I'll never forget, year, years and years and years ago, we were, I mean, we were in apartments for the first eight years of our marriage. And I remember one night I was sitting at the dinner table and Margaret was in the bedroom and the door was closed. And into my mind came the thought, okay, fine, if that's the way you want it, I'll just go out and drive around the car when you're ready to, you know, set things right, we'll get things right. And then God showed up and, and made me realize, I thought, okay, who's coaching you to pull away and say, you come to me? If God's goal is unity, it, it, ain't, it ain't God telling me that, right? And, you know, brought home to me that from, from you know, there in those, thankfully, in those, in those early days that I've got to resist that coaching, that temptation to pull away and be separate. It's, it's my goal to be moving toward my wife. I may feel like I'm walking into a hail of bullets. But my call, the, the call is for unity. And, who, you know, who's coaching you which way? And he's going to whisper in your ear loudly all sorts of the problems that go on because of the diversity that's involved. Guys, because I've heard this so many times and been there myself, do you, do you ever feel like her definition of unity just feels like we always do it my way? Now, if you feel that, that's an illusion. Okay, that, that's a perception. <laughs> Sorry, I probably just got you in trouble. Now you're going to hear about it. <laughs> but if that's what the dynamic feels like, probably what's going on is the way you're leading and the way you're communicating makes her feel like you don't hear her. You're not listening. And so... That's why she feels like she has to be adamant about what she's saying because it, 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 you, might, you might be listening, but the way you're operating is communicating that you're not listening, and so she feels like she, she's got to fight for herself. So the key is how do I make my wife feel heard? And that pretty much takes the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, you've got to, because that's, you, you got to ask for help. It's, it's not just, do I hear her? How do I make her feel heard? Because then she'll be able to trust me and just pray like crazy for God to teach you. In fact, on the hopeful side, the neat part of God putting his picture on marriage is that means that he's for you. He's way more for your marriage and your unity, your union, and, and the, the impact and the fruitfulness of it than you ever will be. Either of you. And that's good news. Not because he's standing back. He's not standing back tapping his toes and saying, okay, let's, let's look like this unity amidst diversity. No, he's, he dived in to be there with. You know, when Jesus gave the great commission, he immediately followed it by saying, and lo, I will be with you always. Even to the end of the age. God calls us to do what he wants us to do, but then he gives himself to us to enable us to do it. And so I know, you know in those early years when we was, I was learning and struggling and the more harder I tried, the, the, you know, the worse I was making it, I, I had to bank on this to say, Lord, I'm, I'm coming to you in prayer, but I come to you in confidence in prayer because I know you want this to work. You've made it for that design, and it's going to take you because I obviously don't have the equipment of what it's going to take. And, and so God is committed to what? Making us in his image. I mean, in Romans 8, Paul says he is, we are those who love him that are called according to his name, are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, of Jesus. He's trying to make us like Jesus. And Jesus, being the perfect man, was therefore the perfect image of God, right? It says in Hebrews 1, he's the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So God is at work to make you like Jesus because he wants to make you like him in his image. So just ask for help and keep on asking every day. Don't, it's, it's not that you ask and then you see if you got it. Just keep asking. Because every day it's just a continual process. And don't question God's commitment to you or to making this happen when it's coming about real slowly. 
I mean, think about it. in Hebrews 5, talking about Jesus as he was living, it says he learned obedience through suffering. So God is always working in you, even and even most particularly in the weight. The weight is where there's the suffering, right? I would say the, the, the faith wouldn't be so hard if it wasn't for the without sight part, where you got to wait and say, okay, is anything going to happen? That's the hard, that's, that's the challenging part is you've got the, the challenge, it may be within your marriage or maybe health or what, you know, whatever your situation is, and you're praying and you're waiting for God to come through. That's where you're tempted to suffer and to get off track, and that's, that's where faith comes in. Is, is trusting, even when you don't see him deliver, it's saying, I'm still banking on you, God. You know, like Peter said, where else are we going to go? Everybody else left, and Jesus turned to his disciples. He said, aren't you guys leaving? And Peter says, you're, you're God. You're the Lord. Where, where are we going to go? You're, you are it. That's faith. And James tells us the trials produce perseverance, so you just keep hanging in there with him. And what you find is, the quality of your trust and your faith and, the, and the, the, your, your spirituality is most evidenced when you don't get what you want. What do you do with it? How do you respond? Do you, do you keep leaning into him when you're not getting it? Say, I'm not getting it, but Lord, you're the one, you're my hope. You're my only hope. And so you want your primary goal not to just be relief but to know him more. And you find that by just exercising the faith muscle. And prayer is doing faith. So what's the equivalence between prayer and faith? Prayer is faith. Prayer is just saying it out loud to God. God, I trust you. I can't do this. You're God. I'm not God. I, I, I don't have a clue. You know, so God says he opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. The proud want immediate attention, immediate delivery. Say, I deserve this from you, God. Why aren't you come, coming through for me? And the humble say, God, I got to trust you. And think about it. You're much more apt to cultivate unity when you've developed the perseverance of being humbled and trusting in humbling yourself before the Lord. And you're less demanding than if you're digging in your heels and trying to get your way. And if you're doing that with God... That helps you be that way with your spouse. Years ago, um, we had a, when I was a singles pastor, uh, had a speaker come, and he, he asked the group, he said, if I were to ask you, what do you think, if you were to get married, what is, what is it about you that you think will probably lead to the most conflict in your marriage? And he gave him a little bit to you know, sit and stew about it. And he said, now I'll bet what you were thinking was all those things about you that you knew would drive somebody up the wall. He said, You're, you know that's what's going to create conflict in your marriage. But he said, guess what? That's not what it's going to be. He said, what it is about you that's going to bring the most conflict in your marriage are your virtues. Because when you know you're right, that's when you dig in your heels. <laughs> I'm like, ooh, touche, wow. Because <laughs> that's true, right? It's when you know you're right that you're not giving an inch. And the, the, the God's humbling us and causing us to trust that you know, I may not be seeing things. I'm, I, I need help. This is bigger than me is where the opportunity comes. Now, you've got unity, but again, the unity is amidst diversity. And, when, and chapter 1 of Genesis focuses more on the unity in marriage, and the chapter 2 describes the diversity it says in chapter 2, it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I'll make a helper fit for him. So God gives Adam the job. Now, chapter 1 of Genesis is kind of like the big picture. You know, in cinematography, when you start and you've got a scene and it shows the whole globe of earth. And then all of a sudden it zeroes in and it shows a little what's going on in somebody's life. That's kind of like going from Genesis 1 to Genesis 2. Genesis 2 tells you the same thing we read in Genesis 1. It just is zeroing in on what's actually happening in the garden. And it tells us God actually did create Adam first, and he gave him a job. But immediately after he gives him the job, God says, he needs help. That's what we call a design deficit. It was a purposeful design deficit before the fall. God made Adam so he could not function alone. But when he says he needs a helper, the, the Hebrew word for helper 
is a word that's only used of one other character in the Old Testament. You know who else that describes? God. God is our helper. So obviously he's not just talking about somebody to carry the tools. Or he's not talking about a junior assistant. When he says he needs a helper. He needs somebody who brings to the table what he doesn't have, which is what God brings to the table, right? He says when, when he made, made woman to be there, to be partners with the man, it was to be complementary. In fact, the word where it says he was fit for her or suited for one another is this picture of uh, being complementary, being like a reflection. Like when you look in the mirror, you see yourself, but it's all backwards. You, know, you ever try to cut your hair in the mirror? You know, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> try to cut your eyebrows and the, you know, or your, you know, and the, and the scissors are all backwards. The, the, God's saying that the woman is, is like the man but different. It's a compliment, filling in the gaps of, of, of where he is. And so there, there's a, a diversity emphasis that God made in order to work together well. There's separate roles. He, he's not to be alone, but she was made as, as a compliment. Now, implication, that means your spouse is custom made for you. Now, every man is different, right? And so our peaks and valleys, the places where we need gaps filled in, are different. So therefore, the match between a husband and wife are, is going to be different. It's, you know, it's not all men are not the same and all women are not the same. They're, 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 and that's part of why the Bible doesn't really say there's all these super specific roles. It gives broad parameters, but it's going to be different for each couple. You know, in some couples, the wife definitely needs to be doing the finances. In some couples, the husband definitely needs to be doing the finances, right? And, it, it, you know, it's just, there are all sorts of ways which our, our roles are not always the same in each couple, but, but we're made to be a complement to one another. But something that happens, when we talk about unity and diversity, if, if I'm doing premarital counseling with a couple and they're engaged and they're, you know, all starry-eyed and gaga about each other, and um, I, I know that they, I, I have to spend more emphasis on talking about the diversity of not of realizing you're about to be jolted by how different you are. Because you feel like, oh, yeah, we like all the same things. We say all the same things. We talk about all the same, you know. It's like, no, they, we focus on the diversity. But if I'm sitting talking with a group of couples who are married, they got the diversity thing down, right? <laughs> so let's, let's work on unity, okay? <laughs> we need to focus a little more on unity. Uh, and the, because and what I tell the pre couples in premarital counseling is you're about to have more conflict just being engaged because, the, you used to just be talking about, you know, what do you want to do tonight, which isn't that complicated. Now you're talking about planning the wedding. You have things you have emotional investment in. You're going to start to, you know, bump heads. And all the things that are charming to you about how this person just sees the world so differently make it a little more challenging when you try to live together, right? And so that's where you can start crawling the walls. And so that the, the unity amidst diversity is when, when you don't see the world differently, and a tip, an implication of this, for example, is that, okay, if God is sovereign, if God is good, if God is wise, and he put us together, then I start being irritated or annoyed because the other person doesn't think right, i.e. the way I think, I need to stop and say, okay, if God made her like that and me like this, what was he trying to offset in me by designing her that way? And if anything, that'll just help you kind of relax and laugh because you realize, oh, yeah, there's two, there's two of us in this. That if, if he's wise, he's put you together. And so he wants us to treasure. Part of the way you build unity is you treasure the differences. Now, it doesn't mean there's not sinful influence on both sides and there's not your flesh that's part of the, the diversity. But uh, it's... We, we, you know, we all instinctively assume everybody sees the world the way we do. We know intellectually that's not how it works, but we functionally, we expect everybody to think the way we do, and we're always shocked when people have a different opinion and a different view of things. And that's where you got to ask God for help. And, and the neat thing is, you know, this whole compatibility thing can be overdone because people do all these things trying to measure compatibility when, in fact, the person you marry is going to change anyway. 
right? And it's not just because you performed your makeover that you intended before you got married. It's <laughs> like Stanley Hauerwas, who was a chaplain at, at Duke, he, he said, you know, we never know who we marry, we just think we do. He said, the primary problem is learning to love and care for the stranger to whom you find yourself married. That, you know, 10 years from now, the person you're married to is going to be a different person. Just like you're going to be a different person in 10 years. I mean, think about who you were 10 years ago. You're not the same, are you? And so loving somebody is, is both loving where you are, but also realizing I, I, I'm going to need help. I need to be God coaching, coaching this. And so incompatibility can be the key to a great marriage because if you embrace it, it keeps you running to Jesus, asking God for help. And that's what he wants you to do. Do you ever feel like, you know, I need to be praying more. I'm, not, I'm just not very disciplined in prayer. Does anybody qualify in that measure? This is how you get it. You try to work real hard on, on the relationship, and the difficulty that's in there will drive you to cry out to God for help. And part of what God had to teach me was I, I had to make it a, a daily practice to say, God, I, I need, you got to teach me how to love my wife. I've got affection for her. It's just perpetual breakdown in the execution. And I, I think I know what I need, and I'm usually too quick to trust what I think. And so, Lord, I need you to teach me. And that, that was the biggest turning point for me as a husband when, when I just started crying out. And it was, it was a long, it's been a long slog since then, but just to say, help me, help me. And so a, a long with striving for unity, we, we want to value and treasure the diversity. If you have those goals in mind, that causes your marriage to start becoming what God intended as being, being a portrait of how the Trinity works. There's unity amidst diversity, and it takes him being in union with you to make that happen. And that's the other picture that marriage points to is Jesus' relationship with the church, that he's the groom and the church is his bride right? And talk about diversity. He's perfect, and we're relentlessly unfaithful to him. Kind of like Hosea. Some of y'all may be studying that in Sunday school. But Jesus humbled himself, and he laid down his life. Why? To pay for our failures. Not just to woo us. It was to us, but it was to deal with our mess, our, our, our shortcomings, our sin, our rebellion, even to the point of his death. But in doing so, he, came, he overcame this radical diversity to bring us into utter unity with him. You know, and you, you, see, you see and you feel how diverse you are from Jesus, right? And it's by faith you stand in the fact that he has established my union with him. I'm in union with Jesus, even though I feel like I'm so different from him. And that's what he gives us this picture of the table for, is to show us what he has done to establish our unity with him, even though we've got that diversity going on. So let's, we, all of us, whether you're married or whether you're not, if you're not married, you, 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 know, you might be or you might consider or you've got friends who are. And so it's important to reflect on these things, but also just in different areas of your life where God connects you with, people who are, who are diverse, who just approach life differently than you are, to honor them and to be one, especially as we're in the Lord together. And uh, if you're younger, I'm mean, just anticipating for down the road of what, what to expect. So let's ask God to see his unity amidst the diversity and what he has done for it and for us in Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you in your wisdom as the creator as the, the recreator, the one who made us new in Jesus. We, we thank you that you described the picture from the very beginning. This is chapter one, chapter one of Genesis. And you told us what you were doing, and you put it before us. And, and the spirit into the world a couple chapters later, and we're, and we're dealing in, with, in the wake of that. But we pray, Father, that you would 
produce in us as you have united us to Jesus and now given us your spirit to actually dwell in us. Cause us just to be quick to ask for help, to lean on you, to lean into you, and that you would bear that fruit in our lives and that we would taste and see that you're good even as we do that at this table. We taste and see that you're good because of what you have done for us through your son Jesus. We were the ones who were broken. We were the ones who were faithless. And you have brought us into your family. You've brought us closer. So we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle Paul if I can turn this page. Oops. Tells us For I received from the Lord what I also delivered you. So Jesus gave this to the Apostle Paul. He said that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then the Apostle Paul says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we eat this bread and we drink the juice and the wine to proclaim the death of Jesus, which is his reconciling work, his work to bridge our diversity, to bring us into union with him. And we're proclaiming that to ourselves, we're proclaiming it to the world. He sets apart by proclaiming this. You're invited to come and to be part of this supper if you are in union with Jesus, if you have put your faith in him, if you've publicly professed your faith, if you're a member of a a Bible-believing church, it doesn't have to be this one, we invite you to come and to eat. Uh, We have gluten-free bread in between. The clear uh, glasses are juice and the frosted glasses are wine. Uh, If you would prefer or if you need to uh, remain in your seat, you can do that. We'll have a couple of elders that will have trays that will actually bring them to you. Otherwise, we invite you to come forward. There will be music playing. You can sing or you can just use it to contemplate what it is uh, that we're doing here. Let's ask uh, the Lord to set us apart and to set these uh, elements apart. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that you've given us a three-dimensional picture of him and of what he's done. And you don't just call us to eat it, you call us to eat believing and that you feed our faith. And so we pray, Father, that you would give us faith that as we eat, we would taste of and treasure and ingest Jesus into our souls and our minds and that you would make us people who find him to be our source of life, that we demonstrate as we eat this bread, and drink this juice and wine. And we pray it all for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.
Jesus took the bread and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. Father, we thank you that as we come to this meal, you invite us as, as members of your family, and yet as we think of Jesus, with his bride, the church, reminded that you're telling us of the depth of your love for us and devotion to us. That it's on the basis of your word, your vow, that you care for us and you provide for us and you protect us. We thank you that it's on the basis of you keeping your word not on us keeping our word. Lord, help us to be faithful in response, to delight in your love. You tell us that rivers of living water will flow from the innermost being of those who believe. We pray that you would cause that to happen, that we would have that, and we'd slosh over on people around us because we have tasted and seen that you are good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing praise to God. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great high priest, whose name is love, whoever lives and waits for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart.
invite you, we've got some Sunday school classes, adult classes on Hosea and on the attributes of God. We also have an inquirer's class if you're interested in learning about the church or joining the church. Children have sing time and then their time. Receive the Lord's benediction. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, may comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen.